Well, good afternoon or, or evening. Uh, welcome to the American University Museum uh, in absentia, I guess. Uh, we are uh, very excited to have a talk with uh, Terry Bronstein today. Uh, Terry Bronstein is a multimedia photomontage artist whose work has been shown in museums and galleries around the world including exhibitions in Paris, Japan, Los Angeles, Barcelona, and Italy. She was born in Washington, D.C., and has lived in California for the past 30 years. But before Terry moved to California, she had a major exhibition at the Washington Project for the Arts in 1977, when I was just a baby. Uh, when Alice Denny was the director, I was her assistant, and uh, uh, <clears throat> most importantly, we watched the launch of the third mission of the Space Shuttle Columbia from Kennedy Space Center in 1982. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be bringing Terry Bronstein and her art back to Washington, if only virtually. Terry taught here for 10 years at the Corcoran School of Art, and the Corcoran had the absolutely greatest faculty. Uh, Terry's work is in numerous public and private collections, and awards and commissions too numerous to mention. My advice is to download the excellent essay uh, and with, with images from our website or order the book that accompanies the exhibition, Who Is She? So Terry, I first met you uh, as a full-blown artist in 1976 when I was working for Alice at the Washington Project for the Arts. When did you decide to become an artist? Oh, well, I was not one of those um, very gifted children who did a lot of doodling and drawing and they and everyone would say, oh, she's gonna be an artist when she grows up. <clears throat> it was nothing like that. It was much more that my parents were very, very interested in the arts, all of them. And I was, I actually studied ballet when I was very young and, um, and they did, send me to a, a, a summer class at the Corcoran when I was in junior high. And it was after that, that class that, um, that I decided at high, in high school that I was gonna take art and work in art. And, then, and just going into the art room at Montgomery Blair High School, which was my, in Silver Spring, mm -hmm. um, I had the most fantastic art teacher, uh, Faye Sherry. And uh, she just, she was the kind of teacher that used to take whatever materials we had and make them magical. So it was wonderful working with, with her. And I decided I was gonna be a, a, an artist after that, that that was what I enjoyed doing more than anything else. And- so did, you, did you have any role models as you were uh, becoming an artist? Uh, who were you looking at trying to- model? Well, yeah, no, actually when I was young, I didn't have, um, I really didn't have any role models. There were no artists in my family at all. And, um, and, but, but once I got to, uh, to college, um, uh, and I did, I, what ha happened was I did go, my parents wanted me to have a, a liberal arts education. So I went to the University of Michigan and um, majored in art there and French and ancient history. And then I also, um, uh, and I realized at that point that all of my professors, um, this is something I realized much later that all of my professors there were male. And so I really didn't have any role models at that point at all. Um, and I never thought about going on for a graduate degree um, until um, after a few years after I left Michigan. Um, we moved to, um, to Annapolis and I took a summer school class at uh, the Maryland Institute with the, the first woman professor I'd had, and she was actually a graduate student, in, and the course was stone lithography. And so here was this woman lifting these heavy stones, and, uh, and she was really my first real role model, and I thought, I could do this. I would love to do this. Um, and um, so when I went to the, Mar then I uh, uh, decided to apply to the Maryland Institute, and uh, ended up going there and actually being in the same class with a couple of people I ended up teaching with later, Bill Dutterer and Lee Hainer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Grace Hardigan was the other person who really influenced me a lot there. She was, uh, she was really 
the first person who asked me to think about why I was making the work I was making and and uh, which something you know I had gotten all of the skills at, in the Michigan Art School but but not really learning how to be an artist and that that happened at, during that time. So Grace Hardigan was the very first artist I ever curated a show for. I was sent there by American University uh, to put together a show, and of course she did everything. Um, but she was she was amazing to work with, and then later I became you know really close to all her students. Uh, but uh, uh, she was uh, she was quite quite a role model, I guess. Uh, did you take her as a role model, or were you sort of off in other directions? Well, you know, the interesting thing was, as much as she taught me, um, by the time I, I always knew that I wanted to have a family, and uh, when uh -oh. I when I started working with her and and learned that she had left her family, left her children to go to New York to be an artist, so there was all she was a role model in the sense that you know she had really made it as an artist and it was wonderful to see her success and 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 she was a terrific teacher. She wasn't a role model in the sense that I could say oh. I could do both of these. And when I graduated from the Maryland Institute, I was eight months pregnant. And so I thought, you know, at that point, people were starting to think, you know, is she really seriously going to be an artist or not? So, because that was during that time. I mean, it was 1968 and um, it was a whole different time. It sure was. Um, I know you attended the uh, Corcoran Conference on Women in the Visual Arts. Uh, did you do that soon after you uh, left uh, left Baltimore's uh, Maryland Institute, or uh, uh, when did when did you attend that conference? It was a few years later, and actually, um, we moved to to Capitol Hill, and um, we were among the pioneers re renovating our home um, on Capitol Hill, and. Um, um, I, at that point, I met Rosemary Wright, and we became friends. And uh, she was the one who actually told me about the conference. It was um, it was very hush hush. They really didn't want Washington artists coming to that conference because the Corcoran only had a, um, an auditorium that seated 250, and there were probably 250 women in Washington that would have loved to have attended. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be a, a, a whole East East Coast conference. And so I found out about it and then came in, burst my way in practically. I mean, I didn't have a ticket or anything, but I did come in on the second day of the conference and um, it had an enormous effect on me. Um, just hearing about all of the ways in which women were um, uh, marginalized at that time, that women were not having exhibitions in galleries. There were no exhibitions of women in museums. And then Linda Nochlin even talked about in her, she's the art historian, a uh, very famous woman art historian. And she was there and talked about how um, there just were no women even in the art history books. And um, so a lot of things became, and I it was at that point that I real, had realized that I just had had no role models as an undergraduate at all. Was this in 1972? The conference, I think, yes, was 72. Yeah. Yes. And, um, and it, uh, at, at the end of that conference, a group of us decided we, we didn't want this to end. So we, we joined together to, be, to create a consciousness raising group. Mm -hmm. And out of that consciousness raising group, we started a Washington Women's Printmakers group and an art registry, which I kept at my house for a long time, but it was all registry of, of artists in Washington that were women. And uh, we had we put together the first women's art exhibition, which was called Paperworks, and um, that was all very exciting and very validating to me because I wanted to do work that was about um, my life and as a as a woman and as a mother at that point, and so that that became very validating. Um, and a, a short time after that, um, there was there were some women who came down from New York. Uh, to jury a show of women artists uh, for AIR gallery in New York. And I showed them a number of different things that I was doing. And at the same time, I showed them my notebooks, which were called the Housewives Ballet and the Motherhood Notebook, one of which I showed 
at the Katzen last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were the ones that they wanted to show. So that was, that was again, very, very validating to, um, to me as an artist and what I wanted to do as an artist. When did you start teaching at the Corcoran? Um, it was a few years after that. And, um, and I came in teaching printmaking. Um, and then within a year or two, I, I started teaching in the full-time curriculum team teaching mm -hmm. with wonderful people there. I mean, um, along with, with Lee Hayner and Bill Dutterer were uh, Rosemary Wright, Bill, Bob Stackhouse, Tom Green, Marie Ringwald, many uh, people who, uh, it was, it was, it was, and, and it was very, for me, I, I just felt as though I grew a lot as an artist. It was um, because uh, it, the, te the team teaching, the whole team teaching method is, is one that, that really, I think, brings out the best in teachers and, and faculty. And, and, um, and, and we were teaching the students how not just to be, uh, have the skills to be artists, but also how to become artists as people, how to self-motivate, how to continue working when, when you felt as though you could, you didn't have a new good idea, and um, so that was all very, very, very um, um, instrumental to me as an artist. I grew a lot then. So uh, one of the elements of your work uh, has been the juxtaposition of materials from different time periods. Uh, why were you interested in this, and has it always been a part of your work? Yes. Well. When I um, when we moved to Capitol Hill in D.C., um, I was looking for a place to to do some work. Couldn't really afford a studio at that point, and so I um, I I uh, started working in the Thomas Jefferson uh, Library, a part of the Library of Congress, and um, I would spread out my Thank things and work it on those large desks in the middle. And uh -huh. someone saw me working there and, and uh, actually a fellow who be later became a very good friend, a poet friend of mine. And he said, you know, there are these little carols, these little offices that are mm -hmm. off of the main reading room. And um, and if you apply and you could probably say, you know, you're teaching at the Corcoran, et cetera, and you could get a, get one of those carols. I mean, this no longer exists, of course, with every the security uh, after 9-11. But at that time, you, I was able to get this little office space, which held a desk and a file cabinet. Mm -hmm. And I was also able to get a stack pass. And the stack pass enabled me to go up into the stacks and to see a lot of the, I, I've always enjoyed doing research around my work. And this was a way for me to, to really do research around the things that I was working on. So that mm -hmm. if I were working on, uh, let's say, house, being a housewife, um, I, everything was organized according to subject matter, not according to year. So there would be these books uh, that, sh that, that talked about that would be like a turn of the, 19th, of the 19th century that would be about making a bed, how to make a bed. And then there mm -hmm. would be other books that would be contemporary. And so I- on, uh, House Wiffery? Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, so I, I just found that, um, that using materials from different time periods, that's when I started really thinking about how people looking at work and my work, since my work is all found images and uh, material that I find in magazines and books from different time periods, that juxtaposing those time periods really caused people to see things that even though things change, there's a similarity to what the expectations are and what things happen over time. So. That's that's always been a, 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 an important part of, of my work. When was this period uh, in, in comparison to your show at the Washington Project for the Arts? Um, I guess 77? 77. Yes, yes. So at that time I was working and I was doing work at the Library of Congress then. Uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. How did uh, how did you transition from artist books into photography? Well, um, my initial books were um, very conceptual, and I really didn't care whether they were that beautifully collaged or cut out. It was really about the concepts. And, you know, I, there was a lot of conceptual art going on at that time, and um, not, but not conceptual art that women were doing, where I 
created charts for carpools and things that was so that it was like a lot of the conceptual work, but I wanted to make it um, based on my life. Mm -hmm. And um, slowly from that, I continued to make work that was about this kind of subject matter, but um, but <clears throat> my, I, I began to become more and more interested in how the, the pages came together, how the collaged images came together. And um, more that was more and more became the case until finally I did a book that was called Windows. And it was the first, it was actually a book that was about the nature of perception itself. And um, I decided all of my books up until this point had been one of a kind books. And um, so I was thinking it would, be a, it would be wonderful to actually create a book that could be a, um, mm -hmm. a published book that could exist in a small edition so that people would be able to actually purchase my work and take it home and spend some time with it. What a concept. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, and so um, so I applied to Visual Studies Workshop in New York and, and they published the book, Windows. And after that was published, what I found was that all of a sudden people were asking me about my photographs at which I had never realized. But of course, once these photo montages were photographed, they became photographs. So, um, and that was very interesting to me. In fact, I was asked to speak at a photography for, uh, uh, at, a, at this, a Society for Photographic Education meeting. And, um, and I had to say that I had never, that I was not using a camera at all. Um, but these were all just, they came together on paper and then they were photographed. And then once that happened, once Windows happened, then I uh, made my first book that was a, um, a totally a book that where the individual pages of the book, I felt could come out and be seen as photographs themselves. It was called Station Identification. And, um, and that was really the beginning of my making photographs um, from, uh, from my photo montages. So uh, you moved to California. Uh, yes. What was that about? Well, Why'd you move? well, we had spent a year out here, um, 10 years before that, um, on a program that my husband was on, which was a, an industry a government industry interchange program. And we loved it. We really fell in love with it. And I, I felt as though I, I, one of my best, well, my best friend, actually, who lived out here, um, was writing um, on photography for the Times at that at that time, and um, so she. I went to a lot of exhibitions with her, and and uh, saw that it just seemed like a very very open atmosphere, and I was very attracted to that. Um, and so and and be in between uh, those times, um, I met Judith Hofberg, and she had me uh, do a one person show at Artworks, which was out in Venice, uh, of my artist books. And so I was really, I was feeling very comfortable with it, with our moving out here. And so when we moved out, I felt as though r right from the start, there wasn't a sense of um, your work fits in this category or that category. But, you know, like I was making these things that were called, that were photographs, but I could also show my books. And I found there to be an openness from out here from the time I came out and um, and I have enjoyed it very much out here. Um, and I and, and, and actually once we moved out here, um, I started making series of photo montages that were separate from books, even though I continued to make the books at the same time. And um, so I'm going to uh, talk about a few of these. Um, this Great. first group is called um, Empty Nest, and um, and it was made created after uh, my daughter left to go to uh, to college, and I was th really thinking at that time about how in the end we're left with our work, even if even if we have a whole life mm -hmm. as a mother, and that uh, and and so this I. I this idea of your work, the endlessness of work is what prompted this image and then led to a whole nother series afterwards, which would called In a Day's Work, which this next image 
uh, talks to. And then, and uh, I think probably, I mean, I, I should say here that, that a lot of my work has followed the different passages of, of life that I've gone through at, at different times. Um, this next group is called Fathers and Sons. And even though I'm not a father or a son, I decided that uh, what I was watching as my uh, husband and son went through um, his adult, his uh, high school years um, made me an authority on, <laughs> on, what, on what it means to be a father or a son and did this series uh, about that. Um, I should just tell you one, one little story about this, uh, the, the, um, the uh, image of, the, of the, uh, the father with his son on the stage um, where he's um, holding a violin that when this was shown um, at the Long Beach Museum and there were a lot of children come through with, the, uh, they have a children's program um, and the children come through, they, uh, one little boy, uh, they, the, the docent asked everyone what they th th saw in the images. And this one little boy said, oh, I'm very, this makes me very, very sad. And the docent said, well, why is that? And she said, well, his father's very upset with him because he hasn't practiced the violin. And I realized, you know, that it's so it's it's it. Your work is, you know, it goes out there, and everyone brings their own things to it. And you know that as an artist, but um, that was one of my favorite stories about that, you know, because it was so it was so uh, I I loved it. Um, um, this next series is called Nuclear Summer, and I did that in response to a, a Parade magazine article that I had read by Carl Sagan, um, it, it had really had an impact on me. It, it, show, it talked about what life on Earth would be like after a nuclear war. And it was called Nuclear Winter. And so I created this series, and there's two images from this series, um, that uh, thinking about what life would be like after a nuclear war. And I, can, I should say at this point that um, that all of these images were done pre Photoshop. Okay. And so, and, it, and so what I would do is I would look for and find images. Sometimes the images came to me first and I would make a work after that. But some, uh, but in a case like this, I found this woman who was actually painting um, in the midst of this nuclear war. She was that size and she was painting something that had the colors of the nuclear explosion in the background. So just, you know, I just mentioned that because all of these images uh, through this whole time period were created, you know, by my cutting out, cutting out and pasting and making the collages from these found images. Uh, they were all the size that I found them. And I, so I wasn't altering size, color, anything, you know, I was, I was just making the collages. And that was what I was going to show at the museum, um, was the original collages so that people could see how they actually come together. I think, you know, this, now that Photoshop is so ubiquitous, it's, it, people think, you know, it, how, you know, you can create things like this much more easily. And of course it's made my life as a photomontage artist easier, but, um, but I thought I would mention that here. Um, this next series, Miami Beach, um, is a uh, was actually what happened in this case? I ran across these images of dinosaurs, and I was reminded of my son when he was five years old. He was studying the dinosaurs in kindergarten, as all of, all children do, and my mother was visiting, and um, and she uh, he said to her, "Grandma, how old are you?" And uh, she <laughs> said, "Oh, I'm very very old." Um, and he said, "Well, were you born before or after the dinosaurs?" And um, that stuck with me, of course, through the years. And when I found those dinosaur images, I was just coming into my 40s. And of course, I thought I was getting old. Um, little did I know how young that was. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I thought, uh, you know, I wanted to do something that was about aging and time. And the, the, those, the images of the dinosaurs were in a, in a uh, surrounding that was very much like both California and and my and Miami, uh, which was where my own grandparents lived when they were when they were old. 
And so um, I decided to do a piece that was sort of about the purposefulness of it, about with which they went about their lives. Um, and so this is called Miami Beach. And this last series uh, that I'll show here is, is called Adolescence Series. And it's it was really sort of about the magic of adolescence. And I, I found a book called The Cantilever and How It Works and Other Scientific Experiments. And that book had these images of these mysterious scientific experiments. And so I placed uh, figures in that would talk about the magic and mystery of adolescence and what it meant thinking about age, about growing older when you're that age, when you're an adolescent. Um, at the same time, I was making artist books and um, and these, uh, they're some of them, what happened was that there's a, there was a wonderful used bookstore called Acres of Books in Long Beach. And it was literally acres of books went on and on forever. And um, I started looking in there for material to use for collage. And it was there that I found, I, I started finding books that were books that actually inspired me to work within them. Um, and the first one of these was called What Beetle Is This? And it was a German book for identifying beetles. And I, um, I thought that the beetles looked very much like they were posing in different fashion outfits. And so I, uh, the book was, went through different time periods and used the beetles and the, um, the, to combine them with images of people and, and showing different fashion and style. And, um, and then there were, uh, altered books that became uh, where I, there were 300 or 400 pages. And I, so I decided I still wanted to use some of these books, but I, ha I had to figure out a way to make them so that they had fewer pages. Um, and so um, I ended up gluing pages together and making sculpted books, um, which is what these next two are. Uh, one of them is, is called, um, uh, Education by Play and Games. And uh, you, it's a little hard to see, but, but, but it, it does, you, it's cut, I've cut through some of the pages so that you can actually have, there's some depth to the, to the imagery. And, um, and then uh, the, this next one is called uh, Metamorphe, which was about my, my, um, my, my breast cancer experience. And uh, so that, uh, and that, that book again had just like two or three pages to it. Mm -hmm. And Boundless, um, which is uh, the last one I'll show of this series, was a whole series that I did that were actually photo montages that never became photographs. Um, I wanted to work with that medium and really think about the sparsity of the pages. I had just seen a Maholi Naj exhibition and was very inspired by the simplicity of a lot of his images. And and so I, uh, this, this, this series was called Boundless and really was about letting go and what it means to let go both psych psychologically and physically um, in one's life. So, uh, You at some point started to make public art. Yes. Um, I... Uh, what happened was that I was invited to be on a on a uh, committee on a panel for uh, creating policy for public art in, in Long Beach. Um, this was in like early 1990s, and they were just thinking about putting in a public art program. And so, being on this committee, I suddenly became aware of public art as a medium as I hadn't been before. And I had always thought, in terms of public art, that you had to know how to work with bronze or you had to know how to work with be a mosaicist and all of these things I didn't realize you know that you could that up the whole system of making public art and commissioning uh, a lot of this, the creation of the work and um, what at the, simultaneous with my being on that committee um, I had a show in a gallery and I had my car with my car was having I was having a lot of trouble with my car and and I was visiting a mechanic um, in Long Beach this, and this woman that, that was the mechanic there, um, I got to know quite well. And I brought in a, one of my announcements for the show. And I said, this show is opening three blocks from here. And you can go and you can see the work and you can have a glass of wine. And she said, oh, no, I could never 
I could never go into a museum or gallery because I've never done that before. I wouldn't know how to behave or how to, what to wear or anything. And I just became so aware of how many people never get into a museum or a gallery. And at that point, I really thought I'd, it would be a wonderful thing to actually get work out so that it could be on the street, people could interact with it. And, you know, to, to, to make work that, that people would really um, uh, be able to respond to and, and have in their lives, you know, without, without going into a museum gallery. And um, so I applied for um, uh, my first public, public art project and was very lucky to get that because I realized after, <laughs> once that happened, how many times you had to apply for public art to get, to get them. Um, it was to do um, a metro station and it was, um, it was fortunate also in that um, the pi these pylons for the metro, these, the round circular stands were already there at the metro station. And so it was a matter of creating art that would go into those pylons. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that was not as uh, difficult as the work that I ended up doing later was where I had to create works that, that were freestanding. But um, it was photo montage and I realized that I could use porcelain enamel, which is the same material that's used on, you know, for part and parks that you go through where they have these informational panels. And so um, I, I created art for that metro station. And then after that, I ended up uh, having work that was part of uh, um, a, uh, the Los Angeles County Museum had a, um, uh, they, they purchased the May Company and they uh, invited uh, artists to apply to, to do art for the windows in the May Company. And so it was a series that was called Windows on Wilshire. And um, I uh, decided to use my windows as a way of talking about what are usually in store windows, which are fashion and style, and to talk about the ideal that we think of when we think of the of what kind of things you, you'd find in store windows. And so that's what um, these two, my two windows in vogue were about. And then the, the last two projects were a Navy Memorial, um, which was done to commemorate the Navy in Long Beach and uses an, a large armillary sphere to, um, to, to tell the history on the panels that went around it. And, um, and a giant book in Cerritos that people could, people could walk, children especially, could walk through um, that was uh, 10 feet high. It's, it's amazing to watch the development of your work. I mean, I first knew it at the Washington Project for the Arts as uh, photo collages, uh, basically. And uh, you've, you've tackled so many different kinds of media since then. It's uh, pretty extraordinary. Uh, tell me about the work that led to uh, Who Is She? The exhibition. Well, you, you know, it, I, as far as, I, uh, let me respond first to what you said about all the media. I never... I never set out to be a multimedia artist. Um, you know, it, it was not like I thought, in how many different medium can I work in? It was as though the, the work itself, uh, just in the same way as I said that my my books led to the photographs in that very mm -hmm. ca careful way. Well, the, the books, as they became more sculptural, led to sculptural pieces. And uh, so it, it was like that. And... Um, um, it was actually what happened was that that I was uh, I had a show and I had met a dancer, a choreographer, uh, Cyrus Parker Jeanette, who is uh, the head of the dance department at Cal State Long Beach. And um, and she went to the see the show and saw an installation that I had made. And she said, um, would you consider collaborating with me on a piece uh, where you could you could create the uh, the set? And uh, I would have the dancers interact with the set. And, um, and I su suggested the idea of making a giant book that the dancers could dance through uh, with doorways and windows that they could interact with. And um, we talked about what would be in the book, what kind of book it would be about. And, and um, 
we decided I, I, I had, she, she was very interested in uh, beat poetry. And I uh, remembered Jack Kerouac had written these wonderful poems about um, the, the uh, they were called the American, American haiku. And so he, uh, she, I suggested that we, um, that we used uh, Jack Kerouac's poems because American haiku, the way that he used words was very much like I collage images. In other words, they were like found words that he put together. They were oftentimes absurd uh, in the way they came together. Um, and she loved that idea. And there we, we actually like found a recording of mm -hmm. Jack, Jack Kerouac reading his poems with Zoot Sims playing mm -hmm. the saxophone behind him. In the morning frost, the cats step slowly. I remembered, since we're talking about the beat poets, I remember these images that I had found when I was on a residency in um, in the upstate New York, um, Yaddo, at Yaddo. And uh, they were images of an exerciser who was um, demonstrating different exercises in a book that was from 1910 or 15. And, um, and I remember that she had this black turtleneck top on, which was very much like the beat poets, you know, and, and black tights. Uh, like the during the beat period, and so I ended up taking her and creating using her to uh, for for images within the set within the dance set, and in the process of doing that, I became just fascinated by how serious uh, she, how seriously she demonstrated the exercises. This kind of um, determination, which is part of how I often will find. Um, the characters in my books and my work is is uh, that they're very much involved in what they're doing, and want I I end up wanting to use that in another way by having them doing something else completely. But they have that determination about them, and so using these images, I spent the next four years, uh, three four years, um, working with her in a lot of different formats. Um, at this point, uh, mostly on the computer to create uh, the, the largest images that I did of her. Um, uh, they, they, they was putting her into different situations and seeing how she would react, mm -hmm. which of course, since I'm the artist, we know deep down that it's not her that's reacting. It's me that's, mm -hmm. that's putting her in these, these situations. But, but um, when, when we did the dance, uh, Cyrus, uh, came up with the, the title, Who Is She? And uh, when we decided, when, when, when the Long Beach Museum decided to, to give me their show, um, the curators decided that that was the perfect title because there was both, there were all of these works that related to her, to this exerciser. So the question was, who is she? And yet at the same time, it was also about my work. So mm -hmm. the, the title was simultaneously about both of us. So, and some of them were as as large as as uh, the the image of the the woman with the bucket over her head was eight feet high, um, and then there were smaller works, and then there were the sculptural works as well. So you 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 take uh, images uh, from I guess wherever you you find them. Have you ever had any trouble with copyright as you as you've been making this work? Well, you know, it's interesting. Someone told me a long, long time ago um, that not to ever worry about copyright until your work sold for enough where, where <laughs> photographers would <laughs> be interested in pursuing you for the a breach. Um, but what happened was that, that I did, I had an exhibition um, at the Tart Gallery uh, the year after we moved out to California. And mm. um, I was fortunate enough 
uh, because we know how hard it is to get press coverage. I was fortunate enough to have Joanne Lewis write a wonderful article for the Washington Post, and they took this big image um, that was uh, from something I called Geography of the Peace, and uh, it was on, on the front page of the style section. And um, the day after the opening, uh, Joe Tark got a call from the, um, the photographer for who had photographed the, um, the images of the black hole that formed the centerpiece of the piece <laughs> uh, for Scientific American. And he said, you know, that those are my, that's my image. And um, it was copyrighted. And so uh, Joe said, well, uh, let me talk to the artist. I'll have to call you back. And he called me in a state <laughs> and said, what should I do? And I said very confidently, I said, um, this work falls under the, um, the fair use uh, section of the copyright law, which states that either it's a small enough portion of an image where that it's, it constitutes fair use, or the image has been significantly changed, um, which is how what happens in this case. And so Joe told him and, and, um, and it was fine. And then the very next day, I took my image over to the copyright <laughs> office of the Library of Congress just to check to, sh to be sure that, that this would fall under fair use. And so I haven't worried about it since. Um, I have on, on some occasions where I um, have um, published work or work that goes into public art, um, I've, I've gotten permission where it was applicable or where I felt it was, it was needed. But um, other than that, I, I, I think they're all out there for me to use. <laughs> So Terry, uh, what are you working on now? What's your next project? Well, I've really, I've my my latest work has been these installations, um, and um, it, it began with this with the installation Time Bound, um, which what I wanted to do here, and it was very much came out of my book work. What I wanted to do was to um, create a situation where it was like um, James Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window where he's looking out the window and he looks and can see into the different apartment rooms across from, uh -huh. from where he's living. He's in a wheelchair. And so what I, what I had in mind was to do uh, these vignettes of um, what it means to get old and to go into sort of the lives of these different people who are senior citizens and thinking about their life. Um, so much of my work has to do with time, passage of time, passages in one way or of another, and um, and and I and, and I, I really really enjoyed. Yeah, this is incredible work. I really and at at the same time as um, I've continued to make artist books, and at this point I think I've done over a hundred artist books. Um, I was making really enjoying when I when I put up the installation time bound at the museum, I realized how much I enjoyed making it, the physical act of making it and using wires and that whole process. And so I went back um, and started making another installation, which was called Ladders. And that was really sort of about the social idea of what it means to climb ladders, but also about heaven and hell and all the different aspects of, of things that ladders could be about. And um, and then this next installation, which I did after my daughter had um, was divorced, and I was thinking about um, the what that means, the dissolution of a marriage, and I uh, created this work called Broken Vows, and um, which was really uh, you can see the bride and groom and the different aspects of marriage coming apart there, um, and reflections. Which, um, which is a, a, an installation that's about uh, how we see ourselves. It's, got, it's full of mirrors, and um, you can even see me reflected in one of them. And, um, and it's really sort of about how we think we see what everyone, we think we know what people see when they see us and how different that is. And the two installations that I've been working on most recently uh, the first, you can see parts of it behind me about time. Um, again, 
bringing in the whole idea of time, which is something that has recurred throughout my work. And, um, and the final one, Pandora's Box, um, which was really inspired by the coronavirus and thinking about all of the ills that are circulating in the world like a virus. So I was thinking about Pandora's Box. Well, Terry, your work has taken uh, many forms in your career as an artist. Uh, do you see any common threads uh, that have continued throughout this work? Well, all of my work is photo montage in one form or another. Um, and it's all made from materials that I find out that exist already in the world. Um, I see myself sort of uh, almost like a poet in the way that I combine images together, the way a poet would words. Um, and more, I think there's more of a similarity in that respect than to other artists, really, in a way, because of my way of working. Um, so I'm, I find three-dimensional objects, I find two-dimensional um, images. Sometimes I find something that inspires me that, that I can keep an image that will, I'll keep for three or four or five years. Like the exerciser was like five years after I found her. And, um, and then other times I'll actually be looking for images to use in my work. Um, but photo montage is the, the main thing that goes throughout. The other thing is, are the, the uh, work that my work is, the subject matter of my work, which, you know, I think it's interesting as an artist, very often I think that I'd be starting something completely new that wasn't like anything I'd ever done before, only to find out that it was an investigation of the same kinds of things that I do over and over again. You know, whether it's style and fashion, time, mm -hmm. uh, passages of life. Uh, so those are all similar things that I've dealt with. Politics also has been a part. Of, it, it's always been something that interests me. And it enters my work like in Nuclear Summer and in Pandora's Box. Um, I should add here, too, that um, one of the things that um, I've done throughout my entire life is is meditation. I started meditating in, in uh, 1969, uh, Transcendental Meditation, and I've always continued to do it since. And I've found that a lot of my um, ideas get formulated and, and come together after I've meditated. It's... Um, something that I find to be a very important part of my life as an artist. And I think because the whole, in, in meditation, you you go to a place where there's a, a, a consciousness that is very universal, and that's really where I, I want people to feel as though what, that what I'm doing is something that they can relate to. And so that, that, uh, that's how that's always been important to me. I think I got my uh, mantra in 1969, too. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so, in California? Were you in California? In California, exactly. Right. right. <laughs> uh, well, tell me about your, um, your materials, your, your objects. Where do they come from? How do you well, uh, they're, from, um, they're from flea markets. They're from yard sales. They're from... Um, uh, some some of the objects come from um, uh, uh, hobby hobby shops where I can find dollhouse furniture, which appears in my work, especially in my installation work. Um, so um, everything is fair game. Uh, I don't. This question often comes up to me: Do I do I use books that are perfectly good that are should should not be destroyed? And the answer is no. I love books. And that all of my books that I end up using have, I'm giving them another life. They were, they're were they all either parts of encyclopedia sets or uh, very damaged and I put them back together. Or um, um, Although there, I have found a few books um, in a place like Acres of Books. Uh, there was a whole section called um, Unsung Poets. And I found a number of, of little, little poetry books that I've used in my work in that in that kind of place, but.
<clears throat> well, Terry, thank you so much for uh, uh, bringing your show sort of to Washington. <laughs> and uh, it's great, great to work with you again since that 1977 show uh, we, we did together. I've always remembered that show with uh, uh, really great fondness and it's so wonderful to see where you've taken your work. So thanks again for coming out. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you and, and, and all the staff at, at, uh, at Katzen for, um, for, for making me feel like I was an important artist, even though we didn't have the show. It was great. Thank you.